a little portion and then I'll get you all um, started. So, um, so welcome uh, to our last uh, shelter series event of 2020. My name is Clarissa Goodlett and I'm the communications director at Preservation North Carolina. And so during this time when sheltering has become a central part of our lives, we wanted to create a space to connect with you to explore the culture, architecture, diversity, and stories of the many buildings and houses, houses that serve as shelters across our state. Um, we will continue the shelter series into 2021. Um, so please visit our website for upcoming events. And uh, this afternoon, we're excited to present the Cohen for Mara House. And we have with us Ted Alexander, who is a um, regional director at Preservation North Carolina and Herb Cohen, who is a famed artist and the original owner of the Cohen for Mayoral House, and Charlie Miller um, who, of Five Points Realty in Charlotte, who is the current owner and renovator of the home. And they're gonna discuss the preservation restoration of this amazing mid-century modern masterpiece. Um, Ted, Herb, and Charlie will share incredible before and after images and discuss the history and restoration journey of this important artistic and historic landmark. Um, but before I turn it over to Ted, I wanted to quickly just go over some housekeeping things for some of you who might um, be new to our shelter series. And I'm gonna share my screen, uh, hopefully it'll work here. All right. Um, so let me close this down. So I think you all can um, see that. So um, we're in a webinar format. So everybody except for our panelists and myself are muted um, as well as your video. So we can't hear you or see you, but we know you're there. We appreciate you all coming this afternoon. Uh, we're recording and live streaming this webinar. It will be available to view later on our social media channels and up on our website. So we'll get that out as quickly as possible for you all um, to view later or to share. If you're having um, any technical issues, um, if you can utilize the chat function um, and we'll try to help you um, get that resolved. And we're gonna hold questions um, until the end of the presentation. Um, and so I'll moderate questions from our attendees so you can ask throughout the presentation, but we'll answer it um, during the Q&A session. And particularly, um, Mr. Cohen and Mr. Miller will be available um, to ask, answer questions about the history and the, the renovation um, of the house during that time. And so down there, I kind of have a little um, picture of the screen you should have. So you can put things in the chat function or click on that Q&A. Um, button, the Q&A was probably easiest to do um, and type in your question and then I'll, I'll ask it. And then if you would take a few minutes um, at the end of the webinar to do a quick survey that should pop up on your screen as soon as you close out the webinar when we're done um, and just answer a few questions for us about what we're doing and um, you know what we could be doing better and if you have thoughts on um, topics, like I said, we will continue the shelter series into 2021. And I also wanted to um, just mention to you all that we've been really delighted and excited to um, host the shelter series um, for our folks for, um, you know, for no cost um, this year as a way to connect um, with, our, with our network and our audience. Um, but we also are, you know, have been successful with, with it and want to continue next year. Um, but doing that requires um, some support um, from you all. So if you've enjoyed what we've done um, and are eager to see it continue um, on to next year, we'd love if you can support us um, with a gift, um, uh, you know, this year to, to help continue this program and other um, kind of outreach initiatives that we have going on. So um, I'm going to put a um, giving link in the uh, chat um, when we get started. And then also when you complete the survey at the end, there's also a link to give there as well. So we hope you all 
Um, if you're enjoying this, we'll consider um, sharing with us a, a gift. All right, and that is all that I have. So I'm going to turn it over um, to Ted. Okay, thank you, Clarissa. And thank you for everyone for being out there today to listen to the presentation about the Cohen Fumero House in Charlotte. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get queued up here. But while I'm doing that, uh, I just want to thank uh, Herb Cohen and Charlie Miller for being on the, uh, on the line today. And uh, this has been, uh, I've been with Preservation North Carolina for 16 years now coming up. And I'll have to say that the Cohen Fumero House is one of the most fascinating houses and not only because of its history, but because of the house itself. Both, both, her, both things just really make this house very interesting. It's also the first uh, property uh, that I have worked with for, with our protective covenants uh, that is a mid-century modern house. And it's in that every sense of the word, it is a mid-century modern house. And also before I kind of start, I would just like to say that a lot of the historical research I'll give credit to is uh, Stuart Gray of the historic uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg Historic Landmarks Commission. He did a lot of research as it is designated as a local historic landmark. So let me talk a little bit about the Cohen Fumero house. The uh, house was built in, and by the way, I will say that uh, Charlie and uh, Herb, uh, there may be times when you uh, see something, something triggers something that you want to say, I hope you will feel free to kind of just break in and say it if the time comes that you may have some insight that I don't have. So please feel free to do that. The house was built in 1961 and designed by Charlotte architect Murray Whisnett. Murray Whisnett is still alive and the builder was a uh, noted uh, builder Gus Benroot, who was the father of former mayor Richard Benroot. And uh, it is, as I said, it's designated as Charlotte Mecklenburg Historic Local Landmark. It was designated in 2013. And it's really only one of about a dozen uh, high style mid century modern homes in Charlotte. And it's important, not only, as I said, because of its architecture, it's the rarity of its architecture in Charlotte Mecklenburg, but also the resume of its, influ its, uh, its owners. And in that line, uh, both Cohen and Fermero were huge contributors to the arts scene in Charlotte. Now, this is, the way the house we found it uh, back about 2015. Uh, and to give you an idea, I want to give you an idea of the length of time these projects can often take. We were approached by the then owners, uh, John Moore and Angeles Ortega Moore in 2015. John is a current Preservation North Carolina board member and they, and he was very interested in making sure that this house was protected and safe. Uh, they recognized the importance of the house, but it was vacant. Uh, unfortunately, he and his wife had divorced. However, they both loved the house and they knew it should be safe and preserved. But it was beginning to deteriorate as houses do if they don't have people uh, living in them. Houses love people and, and houses love air but they don't like water. But John, uh, it, it was a little bit compounded also because John was living in Winston-Salem and now at least in Colorado. And by the time we were able to sign an option is what we typically do in 2018. As I said, the house was beginning to show some signs of serious neglect by vacancy. And you can see how the, the condition of the house as it was in 2018. I'll talk just a brief bit about Murray Whisnett, the architect. He was born in 1932 and it was a graduate of NC State School of Design, which was then under the leadership of Henry L. Camp Hefner. And this is the house 
this is the Henry Camp Hefner House that Preservation North Carolina has also uh, placed under protective covenants. And Murray, according to his own uh, inter interviews, was most influenced by uh, Eduardo Fernando Catalona at NC State at the time. Also, of course, this was the time that George Matsumoto was highly influential at the NC State School of Design and Architecture. And Fernando Catalona had studied under Walter Gropius and Marcel Brewer. And, and Whitsnut began his practice in 1956 in Charlotte. And, and as I said, he's still alive today. And he's recently done an interview with uh, the Charlotte Mecklenburg Landmarks Commission. I'm gonna show a couple of his, a few, just a few of his noted buildings. One of the most famous was the Van Heck Wetok building at UNC um, School of Law. I understand it's been completely uh, renovated on the interior, but the exterior certainly has the lines of the mid-century modern. Uh, and then his own house, this was uh, Murray Whistner's own house in Charlotte at 6366 Sharon Hills Road. And then this was another really cool house at 5810 Masters Court in Charlotte. This was built in 1979. Uh, unfortunately, it's believed, we believe this has been uh, raised and another house has been built in its place. So these houses are in danger of being lost and we, we need to look to preserve those. Now the work on the Cohen Fermero house was begun in the fall of 1960. Am I correct there, Herb? That's correct, yes. Okay. And um, uh, Vinroot was very well known for his quality workmanship. And when you look at this house close up, you can tell this house was very well and solidly built. And they, designed, they, they built the house on a secluded lot at the end of a dead end street in Charlotte. And it's really important to remember that this was a dead end street at, at the time. And I'll tell you why in a minute. That's the original plat for that uh, lot there. Now the original owners, whom one of which is on the line today, were Herb, Co Herb Cohen and Jose Fermero. Uh, and they told at the time, and you can correct me, Herb, if I'm wrong, right, but uh, they were told that uh, Murray Whistnett said, you told him that there would be just something with no boundaries, just something out there. And, uh, and Herb, you came to Charlotte in 1958, I believe, as the exhibitions director for the Charlotte Mint Museum of Art. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And you're a painter, I believe. No, I'm a potter. And potter, excuse me, yes. The, uh, uh, Jose was the painter, yes. Jose. You were the potter, yes. And, uh, and then Jose came from Cuba and he worked for Collins and Aikman designing cars and airplane fabrics. And I believe he was the artist, is that correct? He was a painter and, painter. and a, a fabric artist. Fabric artist. Yeah. So, you know, this is really an interesting thing because within the house itself, um, y'all y'all became quite the hotspot for uh, entertaining the artists and artists throughout the region and from the world. And this is a picture that we have of y'all in your house there. I don't know the year of this picture, but... Uh, you, you, you really became quite the focal point of the arts community in Charlotte. Do you want to say anything about some of the folks who came by and visited with you? Well, um, we belong to um, the Mint Museum Drama Guild, uh, which put on productions all through the year. And uh, there were people who would uh, come and see the productions. And um, we had... Uh, many meetings in our home for um, audience members and, and cast members and uh, other people who came from uh, different parts of uh, North Carolina to see the productions. Um, we also uh, were in touch with uh, people who were um, involved with the museum work and um, I was 
a member of the North Carolina National Bank Arts Committee um, for a couple of years. And we um, were in touch with people from different parts of the world who um, were collected by North Carolina National Bank. And, and uh, one time when we had uh, Richard Liphold, who was an internationally known uh, sculptor, um, who was commissioned to do some work at uh, North Carolina National Bank, um, he would come to our home and uh, uh, enjoy our um, hospitality and um, a good Murray Wisnan's wife was involved with, um, her name was Charlene Swansea Wisnant. She was involved with the uh, with literature group and um, published uh, the Red Clay Reader for a number of years. And um, she would bring people from different parts of the country who were working with her in her uh, book um, to our home. And uh, some of the people were uh, people like Kate, um, um, Kate Millett and uh, her husband Fumio Yashimura. Um, so people of that kind that were at our home and we um, entertained people who would um, come to uh, visit Charlotte and who were involved in the arts and we uh, got to know through different friends. I have a list here, uh, Mr. Cohen, about some of the folks that you mentioned a couple. And apparently Sunday afternoons would, uh, would were a very busy time around your house. They, the people, would you would fix brunch. And I don't know how in the world you did it in that little kitchen. And I'm going to have to ask you that in just a minute. But uh, people would say, well, they were just driving by. Well, if you noticed earlier, I said they were you were on a dead end street, and so people just didn't drive by. I don't think, but they 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 felt so comfortable and at home at your house, they would come. and And here are some of the guests that that uh, you probably remember well. Uh, I have it as Lunas McGlowan came by. Uh, right. meant, uh, the Italian sculptor Arnold Parmadoro. Uh, right. You meant you mentioned the sculptor Richard Lipold. Mm -hmm. the, and y Yashimura, and then Ed Malthrop, uh, who is actually known as the father of modern wood turning. That's right. And then uh, clay artist Cynthia Bringle, mm -hmm. and then the NC painter Philip Moose. Right. And then author Jam Karan, and, and, and I know there were many others as well, but that's just a sampling of the people, the caliber of the folks that came by y'all's house on a fairly regularly basis here in little Charlotte, North Carolina at the time back in the 60s. And now you can tell me how in the world did you cook out of that little, how did y'all serve all those people out of that little kitchen in the house? I'll show a picture of it in a minute. But Well, um, we were just well organized and, <laughs> and we knew what we wanted to, to um, serve and, and uh, we spent a good deal of time in the kitchen. Jose was a, a very good cook, and uh, we just we just did. That's Let's all. show. I'll show a couple of pictures of the house. And uh, Whisnet designed the house around this. This is from the outside, the exterior. He designed it around the central block core, and uh, such as many um, early American homes were. Uh, they were built around a central hearth and in that core, in that brick core, you had the heating and air conditioning, the plumbing, all of that was located in there along with the bathrooms and the kitchen. And you see here is, now this is a not the kitchen as it was at the time it was designed, but that's the size of the kitchen uh, in the mid, and which is not atypical of many mid-century modern homes to have a fairly small kitchen like that. But so you know what I'm talking about when I said we had all those people over to your house, this little kitchen right here. That kitchen also included a washer dryer combination. 
That's a clothes washer dry combination. <laughs> I don't know how you fit it in there. But, uh, and then of course the bathrooms were, this is a remodel at a later date, but the bathrooms were in the, uh, the core there. And this is, it had skylights. And um, I believe uh, y'all moved to Blowing Rock in 1972, is that correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Philip Moose, I believe, later on moved up to Blowing Rock, the painter, I believe. Well, we moved there because of, um, well, he was one of the reasons we moved, we selected Blowing Rock. Of course, he was a good friend. Yes. And we purchased property from him to build our house at Blowing I, Rock. I'm glad to know that connection. I did not know that, that connection. I actually have one of his paintings. Um, and then, of course, as is so many of the mid-century modern houses, you have the flat roof, uh, you have the continuous uh, brick veneer block foundation, uh, you have some floating walls, and uh, they are clad, clad with these grooved panels, you see, and the fence was lowered just a little bit below the house, so you get that level, the different levels, and it was clad with the T1 11 siding. And of course you had privacy with the courtyard. You had the sliding glass windows, um, which broke down the barrier between the indoors and outdoors. And uh, as I said, the wall is about 16 inches lower than the house. And so that gives it depth from uh, a distance. And it also allows it to kind of float. Uh, the, 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 the foundation walls appear to float above the main portion of the house. And then you interior, you have the brick core. And am I correct, Herb, that the wall in the main section here had, uh, it was designed so that um, paintings could be hung on this wall, is that correct? That's right, it had a, um, a, a metal uh, strip inserted into the, between the top, brick and the second brick down, I guess that was. And it was uh, so that we could hang um, loops from that um, metal bar and we could keep changing the pictures that we had in the, uh, in the collection on the wall. Did you, dis did you display your artwork particularly, uh, Mr. Cohen, or did you display uh others or? Oh, ours and other people's, too. Did you take them on a regular basis? Were they, were, was it a revolving kind of thing, or was it sort Yes, of it was. Kind of... The walls were changed, uh, um, like I did the exhibitions at the Mint Museum. We changed the exhibitions in the house. And Charlie, you, you may have seen that little strip up there, that metal strip, uh, when you were redoing the house. I guess you probably saw that little metal strip up at the top on the brick wall. I don't know if you noticed that or not. Oh yeah, um, it's being used That's currently. good, that's great. And then we have the built-in display cabinet and um, I believe that's, you, did you do the same thing Herb with the, with pottery and so forth on this? this, uh, this? Uh, yeah, we had, um, um, our own pottery. We had some um, a collection of of um, works from different uh, periods of of art, and uh, they were housed in in that um, closet that enters from the side door of that whole unit. It was the the back of the uh, shelves behind that is a closet that housed our collection and other things okay. in there. Now, so we could change the exhibit there and the cabinets underneath also held um, more collection. So when you had the house designed by Murray Wisnett, you specifically, I suppose, told him you wanted to have a place to, to both hang paintings and display paintings and to display 
sculpture and other artifacts. And this is kind of his solution for that. And it works very well, I assume. Yes, it did. It worked very well. That's great. And I did not know that the closet <laughs> there behind the was where you would, you would store the artifacts and things to, to display. That's pretty cool. Uh, <clears throat> so this was, um, there was also a guest room built or a guest suite built into the house. And where you see the washer and dryer now was a small kitchenette. Uh, and I believe this was done for um, Jose's parents. Is that right? That's right. Jose's parents lived with us. <clears throat> they had what is the master bedroom, which is right uh, to the left of that. Uh, the, or the entrance is on the left to the master bedroom and, and bath. And the um, where the washer dryer is, there was a Pullman kitchen. And they had their own entrance through the... Um, uh, glass doors, which is on the right, on the left, which you can't see, which goes out to the co a courtyard, which was theirs. And um, so they could have privacy as, as we could. And, um, but the, there was never, the door was never locked between that area and the rest of the house. Interesting. And I also just sort of, uh, in terms of the architectural feature, you see the, the slab doors and the thin oak floors and throughout the house. And just a couple of other features throughout the house. You know, you remember these uh, light fixtures? Oh, yes. That, this, I think this is the only set that's still extant that uh, was of that era, the original, and they're quite interesting. Yeah. Um, you see the slab mahogany doors and the recessed latches. Um, the narrow halls, this is all sort of um, part and parcel of mid-century modern uh, high-style architecture. You see the, if you'll notice under the window there, this is the only window on the north wall. And it was rather ingenious because uh, it kind of brings the inside to the outside and the outside inside. And then if you look under to the, at the bottom at the base, you see the, um, the kind of floating walls there. There's a space there where a baseboard normally would be in most houses and you see it's recessed and it appears that the walls are floating. But that, but that window bridges the, the difference between the indoors and outdoors. And then of course, in the main living room, um, it flows with no delineation into that dining room area. And you see the bank of the sliding glass doors. And when, well, when we obtained the, this photo, the, the option in 2018, we started with having the entire area cleaned. It needed it. And uh, all the walls were polished down. Those beautiful walls and had lemon oil. Uh, we use that to, to cover the walls and really clean them down very well. And in, in vacant, it looks really good. However, uh, as I mentioned, houses don't like water. And uh, upon going to show the property one day, maybe it's before I show it to you, Charlie, I don't know, but I walked into the, the building and uh, all of a sudden the flat roof, which can cause problems, had caused problems. And there we were with uh, quite a mess. And uh, unknown to us, the flat roof had been suffering for some time. So I had to kind of clean things up. This is just sort of the day in the life of a preservationist. And we operate on a pretty minuscule budget. So we kind of took a large blue recycling, uh, roll out recycling container and set it right there where the water would come in. And it worked really well to be able to catch the water until we could get the, the roof uh, patched together. The owners did put together a temporary roof, um, but wouldn't you know it, as, as, as luck would have it, you know, th this was an unusual weather year in 2018. The average rainfall of the previous eight years had been 42 inches and 109 days worth of rain. That was the previous year. In 2018, wouldn't you know it, we had 136 days of rain 
and 59.2 inches. So we were battling water uh, the whole time. And of course, dampness affects everything. There's the kind of the temporary roof we uh, tarp we put on top up there just to hold it together long enough. And the dampness affects everything. The front door was swollen. We had to have a friend come fix the door. Uh, we, we couldn't open the door. It, it, we had to get that. It was swollen shut. And I probably showed this house. It was a lot of interest. Uh, and about 50 times probably to different people. And uh, it had developed mosquitoes in the backyard. There was a, 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 a electrical tower that had not been there in 2015 when I visited the first time. I'd show it to people who were kind of interested in tearing out the brick core and opening up everything like HDV, HDTV tells you you're supposed to, or they'd want to paint all the wood. And, you know, these are just not the kinds of folks that we felt like would be best stewards for this house. However, then we found just the right person, and that is Charlie Miller, who is on the line here today. And we were so fortunate that Charlie took an interest in this house. And, and why don't, before I go a little further and talk about the work, Charlie, why don't you tell a little bit about your, what attracted you to this property and kind of your, your background when you, when you started looking at this house? Sure. So um, by chance, uh, I'm, I'm a real estate broker by trade. I also uh, own a construction company. Um, but in 2015, uh, John Moore, the owner, reached out um, through uh, just by chance and was curious about a valuation on the property. So that was really the first time I became aware of, of the home. And it, it just struck me. Now, before that, <clears throat> I had, you know, I'd been very interest, interested in mid-century modernism, uh, you know, a student of it to an extent and, and done some, some non-historic type renovations around Charlotte. So, you know, as soon as I saw, did my research and, and saw the home, I was, I was captivated in a way. And uh, I stayed in touch with, uh, with Mr. Moore for a few years. Uh, every couple months, I'd just reach out, touch base, um, you know, wasn't quite ready. You know, he had a very uh, sentimental attachment to the home. And then, you know, he went through the process of, um, of uh, getting together with Preservation North Carolina to impose the deed restrictions and everything. And uh, at that point decided, you know, it was time to offer it up for sale through Preservation North Carolina. And, um, you know, at, at that point, I, it was something that I, uh, had to seriously consider. And, um, you know, next thing you know, uh, Ted and I have worked out an agreement for me to, to purchase the home and um, be the steward of its restoration. And we are so glad that you did. I'm going to kind of take our viewers on a little bit of a trip here and to show sort of the process that the house went through. And Charlie, you may want to interject at any time, but I'm going to kind of just show some pictures, you know, uh, the, this is some of the work in progress. Uh, you kind of had to basically take out all of the kitchen, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's correct. The kitchen uh, was one of the main uh, entry points for for water. So it uh, you, you saw some of the the ceiling on the floor outside that kitchen space, and some of the water on the floor, but really that kitchen was taking the brunt of, uh, of the, the water intrusion at the top of the brick core. So, uh, you know, that combined with the fact that it had been renovated at some point, you know, 20 years ago with Home Depot cabinets and, you know, um, non-period correct materials, it, it was going to have to come out anyway, but this just, you know, kind of kind of forced it to happen up front. And uh, there's a couple of other things uh, that go on in, in terms of rehab of houses that a lot of people don't think about sometimes. That's the human element. And one of the things that uh, I appreciate very much about Charlie was that uh, there were some appliances and so forth in the house that really he was not going to use. And so we found a ministry nearby in Shelby, and uh, he was gracious enough to, you know, to allow those to go 
to a, a family that could use those. But people don't think about these things often. And that's part of, I think, our role of recycling and reusing and repurposing things. And we appreciated that from Charlie from the get go, that he was very intent on re repurposing things. And so this is, I'm just gonna let a couple of these prop pictures speak for themselves. And Charlie, if you wanna talk about anything that as I show these before and afters, you might wanna talk a little bit about your experiences. And I think what you're gonna see at the end, Mr. Cohen, is I think it's something you're gonna be really proud of uh, by the time that this uh, is over. So I'm gonna kind of start showing some before and afters. And uh, of course, this was the front door, the main entrance. And you notice, it, it we'll say, as you, you notice, as you walk in the front door, it's kind of a dead wall. That's not another, that is also another kind of aspect of mid-century modern architecture that is very prevalent, that you would walk into sort of a, a dead wall at times. But, but look at the condition of the house. It was beginning to show its age and its lack of uh, maintenance. And then after. You have any comments about that, Charlie? Anything that you, <laughs> that's pretty, pretty dramatic from that. Yeah, so that. in the, in the before photo, um, that whole wood deck structure had to be ripped out and, and rebuilt and replaced. Uh, the wood was just, it was rotten and, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't safe to walk on and you can kind of see where the dark uh, piece over the wood down there in the hole, it was, you know, that was, that was because somebody put their foot through it trying to, trying to walk into the house. So um, that was really the, one of the first things with the project as a whole is to kind of, you know, make sure it was safe. And um, outside of that, you know, at some point somebody came in and put some mission style lighting here in the first photo and, you know, the house numbers are, you know, nothing special, not period era. So, um, this was one of the areas, you know, the front entry is on the side of the house, but you know, this is, this is one of the first things you see on the house when you're, when you're walking up. So it was important to me to, uh, to really kind of give it a, uh, make it a statement and get the right kind of lighting and, you know, some neat house numbers and great door hardware and, and, and all of that. So I'm, I'm really pleased with, with how that turned out in the end. The effect is really stunning. And then. Here's another, we'll go to another before. This was that courtyard right outside the front door. That's a peach tree, is it, is it not? Did you did you plant that, Herb? Was that was that there when you were there? Was no, no, we didn't have a peach tree there. That was a peach. No, we had something else in there, which was not inside that courtyard. We had, I can't, I can't remember. I think there were some bushes originally in that area we found it starting the work or how Charlie found it and then quite a dramatic change and you kept the peach tree I thought that was kind of neat but uh, this this is just so stunning the what a difference and then here here was the deck that, that somebody had put on at some point in time um, you know it was beginning to uh, fail and, and look pretty poor and I'm just going to let the picture speak for itself. This is the actor. Any comments regarding this, Charlie? Yeah, so the deck in the before picture, um, again, it, it was falling apart. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was not original to the home. And, you know, I've, I've had the pleasure of, of meeting Herb uh, a handful of times and, and uh, picking his brain and, and seeing, you know, trying to understand what things were like originally. And what I've, uh, you know, what heard, heard explained to me was there was a cantilever deck off, off the house originally and uh, with no railings. Well, when I took this deck off, I could see where the cantilever joists had been cut. Somebody at some point had come along and cut all those joists off. So I wasn't, wasn't able to, to replicate the original, but what I was able to do was uh, build out a deck and, and cantilever the last three feet of it. So it looks like it floats out over the, uh, the uh, courtyard stone area in the rear there, which a uh, little bit difficult to see in this photo, 
but it it kind of gives that gives that impression and also it's it's up to modern day code so uh my my little girls are safe on it which is good it's a dramatic change and then of course here was the entrance uh as i mentioned you open up and go into the entrance uh, there and um here's the after and um uh, uh, quite quite a stunning difference, including the attack of the fifty foot woman poster, which is pretty amazing. There, um, what, what any thoughts on on this uh, as you found things, uh, Charlie? Yeah, so you know it it was in, like you had mentioned. Um, it's common for mid century homes you you walk into a dead space. Well, the paneling was was in relatively good condition um, in this section of the house, and and we did a as good of a refurbishment job as we could without detracting from some of the patina and just evidence of, you know, that this, this home is, is 60 years old and has had a life. And, you know, we didn't want to scrub that out, but um, in this space, I really wanted to kind of have an impactful, uh, you know, impactful entry. And, you know, after cleaning everything up and, and getting those, uh, Philippine mahogany panels looking great. Um, found a cool art print uh, from a you know from a '60s era movie and the right rug and furniture and and you know people really really kind of enjoy it when they walk in. So it's it's neat. How did you uh, treat the wood? I mean, what was sort of your process of cleaning the wood? Did you use anything special? Um, I'll, what I'll was your honest. I. Uh, I interviewed a dozen different uh, specialty contractors before I landed on someone I trusted. And uh, it was a combination of, of a deep cleaning. And then uh, I think it was beeswax oil is what they ended up using. Um, and, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't sand anything. We didn't, uh, we didn't stain anything. It was really, really, we just wanted to, to use what was there and and have it cleaned really really nicely and you know it was a it was a labor intensive project for these guys but they're one of the better um, specialty painting contractors in in town and they were worth every penny. Well, it's it's amazing the uh, the sh the shine on the the wall and just the rich um, nature of the the wood that comes through uh, you know from what you did and it would be really interesting to to find out exactly kind of what they cleaned it with and what they, you know, but the beeswax is a, is a good product. And, but this is just phenomenal the way it, the beauty was there. It was just covered up over mm -hmm. years and years of, I guess, just grime and, and, and just dirt. So well, it, it, after I get the, uh, the exact process and, and uh, um, products that they used and I'll, I'll, Fill you That'd be great. If somebody you know is curious, because I'm sure there are other people who have similar situations. And then, of course, you had the pool with the uh, um, the, the built-in uh, display cabinet, and then the after. It's pretty dramatic. Um, and in, in, and you you retained the recessed lights. Um, and anything else in, that you'd like to speak about here, Charlie, in terms of the house or anything? Well, you know, this, this was part of the house that, it, you know, even when I bought it, when other parts of it were, were not looking so great, that this, uh, it, it was still beautiful. It's and good. Really, all it needed was some TLC by the right people with the right skills. And then, um, you know, the the right kind of retro style furniture and 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 things and I've actually got a few of her a uh, few pots that Herb designed in in this shot down down on the bottom and I've been uh, I've been able to to source a few more just uh, online over the last couple months so uh, it's neat to get get some of Herb's designs back in the house. Herb, I'd be curious as to whether or not when you look at these pictures, does this bring back, do you feel as if like you're kind of, this this was your home, you, you feel like that, that it's been well respected and that, that you, you just could walk right back into it? Oh, yes. 
and I have, I have been in the house uh, since Charlie has uh, restored it and he's done a wonderful job and I appreciate the, the effort that went into uh, making it uh, a beautiful living space again. We'll continue on just a couple of shots here of some befores and afters. This was the uh, the main living room. This was prior to the, uh, actually before we even took over, this was back probably about 2013 or so. And then it's a pretty amazing transformation, not only because of the work that you did, Charlie, but also you've, you've done an, an outstanding job with the furniture and the furnishings and everything like that. You might want to talk a little bit about Charlie about the use of the building and how you see the use and what it what you know what do you build the house for? Well um, you know Ted when you and I first met and got together on this the the idea was to to turn it into um, a short-term rental property for people to to be able to come and enjoy. And, uh, you know, that, that may end up being what happens at some point in the future, but, um, I had the opportunity as I was wrapping it up to, to actually, uh, it, it really started to kind of hit me how special this place was as I got, as I got to spend more and more time in it, um, as it was coming together at the end. And, uh, I had the opportunity to move in. So I've, I've been living here since, uh, since August and, you know, it's, it, it's been, um, I tell people it, it has a special energy. Um, this home does with all the textures and the wood paneling and the brick and the, the glass walls and, you know, the not being able to see any neighbors through any of my windows. It's just all natural space. And, you know, in a, in a year, like we've had like 2020, um, it's been, a it's been a really great option for me to be able to, to live in this space and, um, you know, experience it. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. That's great. Well, we're going to continue on just a little bit. And I want to show, again, this is that main room, the living room before, another angle. Now, Herb, this is a question that I have that I have not had settled yet, but when the house was built originally, was the fireplace in the left corner there or was that something else? We didn't have a fireplace. No, that was that was installed by someone who owned it after we after we sold it. Okay. Not by it's, the first person who, who right. owned it, but some people afterwards. It seems now, to work. It seems to work even though it wasn't original and, and uh, it you know it seems to have that kind of 60s feel to it, even though, again, it, 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 I believe somebody said there was a desk, a built-in desk or something there. Originally. Yes, we had, we had bookshelves and a built-in desk on that, uh, the window wall there that took up the whole wall, the, the rest of the, of the area there. Okay. And then this was that. This is this is kind of an interesting story that I'm going to embark on here. This is the dining room, and you see the window, the north window, and how the inside goes to the outside and all. And you see the floating panels there on the the wall. But in today's modern living and and sort the way that things work now, the, the kitchen was just it was just too small, was it not, Charlie? Yeah, it, it was, it was tight. It was cramped. <laughs> so Charlie approached both Preservation North Carolina and the Historic Landmarks Commission, which this is a local landmark, about an idea in terms of how to create a kitchen space, a, a workable kitchen space, and yet respect the, um, the building as it was. So really, looking into that guest room, we thought that you could open it up in this one instance and create a really good space. And this is your brother, I believe, Charlie. I, I walked in one day and he was very carefully removing the uh, panel walls there so that you could be reused and open it up 
in that respect. Now we're not, you know, we're not advocating opening up houses all the time for everything, which is sort of the rage these days. But in this particular case, I think you did an outstanding job of respecting the building and the use. Uh, needing a good kitchen. So I'm just going to take you a little further and then I'm ask you if you want to make some comments further, Charlie. And then this is the end product. I mean, I think it's pretty astounding. And if you look on the back wall uh, where the orange uh, telephone hanging on the wall is, you'll see that the wall, that's the paneling that was reused from the, the wall that separated the dining room from the guest room. And you'll also see, I think, which is kind of a really neat detail and this is how I think Charlie has done such a great job you see the uh, the kind of the fan over the kitchen which was a similar kind of fan that was in the small kitchen that, that 1950s round exhaust fan and then you see the uh, there's the window uh, that brings the indoors to the outdoors you want to say anything a little bit about this whole transformation sure uh, sure so you know uh lifestyle these days 2020 um bigger kitchens bigger master baths um uh spend a lot of time in those areas so when uh i was looking at the the central brick core and the the existing kitchen and the the small master bath um it, it the first thing was okay can we can we conceive a a tasteful way to get a, a larger kitchen space um, that potentially could uh, appear that if it was could have been always original to the home, and um, same thing with the master bathroom. How how, do, how can we expand this footprint without actually expanding the footprint of the home? And uh, Jose Fumero's parents in law suite in the home it seemed it, that seemed like the the logical place to uh, to relocate the kitchen to. Um, for one reason, there was a kitchenette there originally, so there was some precedent there. Um, but also, uh, you know, there was the one wall that could be taken down without major structural um, changes and modifications to the house being made. So, toyed around with a few different layouts and and um, designs for cabinetry and, and things like that. And, uh, you know, I collaborated with, uh, with Ted and Preservation North Carolina and the lo local historic landmark commission and, and it, it made sense to everyone. So um, ultimately uh, everybody signed off and, and I'm, I'm very pleased with, with how it turned out now. Um, the, where the wall was on the floor, um, I did, so we have the, the skinny plank hardwood running all through the house. I did a larger plank um, piece of hardwood uh, where that wall was sitting originally, just, you know, to be able to subtly uh, be able to point out and delineate that space should, you know, if anybody, you know, comes in and, and um, tours the home and, and is curious about that change, you can, I can point that out very easily to them and it, it becomes evident of where the wall used to be. The details that really make this just a, an astounding um, renovation here. And here's further, that's the fan I mentioned, just the little details. And as you mentioned, Charlie, it was a really good observation that it, it was some precedent in the fact that that guest room had actually had a kitchenette in it. And we felt that that would uh, that sort of lent itself to uh, some precedent for allowing a kitchen to go into this area and it's worked out very well. Yeah. Uh, this was one of the, um, this was the master bedroom, I guess, that uh, the Fumero's uh, parents lived in. And this is the before. And here we go, after, just a very dramatic change of before and after. The bedrooms were not particularly large, and that's also a common feature in mid-century modern uh, houses. They're just not that large, but you've done a great job in, I think, making it seem much roomier. This was the bath. This is the after of the bathroom, and again, that's 
Preservation North Carolina, we give a lot of flexibility for bathrooms and kitchens because you have to live in these houses. You know, we're not trying to create museums per se. We're trying to keep the main characteristics of the house. The people need to live in them and they want to feel like this is sort of their space that they can use. And you've done a very good job on the bathroom there. This was the other, one of the other bedrooms. Again, just sort of, you see the floating walls, you see the, 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 the sliding glass doors, relatively small space, but with a different color of paint and furnishings and everything. It's just, it's really zipped it up. You have any comments regarding that, Charlie? Yeah, so, you know, it, when, you, when you buy a property like this, and you have the intention of preservation, you have to kind of square yourself with the fact that, you know, your, your closets are going to be somewhat smaller. Your, the bedrooms are going to be somewhat smaller, but um, that's okay. And it, it's, it's worked out just fine here. Um, you know, part of the, the thing with this home is the bedroom doesn't stop here around these four walls. You have a sliding door out into a courtyard and, and that's, that's evident throughout the entire home. It's, it's really indoor outdoor living, um, at, you know, at its finest for, for Charlotte and our climate and everything. And, um, it, it really makes it a, a neat experience to, to live here and be able to enjoy. Really good point. I mean, that was the genius, I think, that Murray Whistner brought the indoor, the outdoors into the indoors and the indoors to the outdoors. And there's that transitional area, but yet you, it gives you almost additional space, particularly in good weather. You can, you know, you just move from one freely to the other and it's like a, just a different part of the room. It's very interesting. And, and here we have, I believe our celebrity of the day, uh, uh, being interviewed, I believe you want to talk a little bit about when you returned to the house, Herb, and uh, what you what you what was your thoughts when you came into the house and you saw this? How long had it been since you had been in the house? Oh, I'm, I can't remember. It was probably more than twenty years, twenty five years, a good deal longer than that, possibly. Um, the last time I was in the inside the house was when the people who purchased the house, the second people who purchased the house became friends with some of our uh, original neighbors who lived down the street and they took us over to meet them. And um, it was funny because they had some pieces of furniture that matched the same ones that we had originally had in the house and they had them in the same spots <laughs> in the, in the uh, rooms as, as we had them. Um, but um, walking into the house uh, this past uh, year that um, since Charlie has fixed, has renovated it is, uh, brought back some wonderful memories and and uh, it's just uh, delightful to see um, what he's done with it and how it how well it works now well, and I believe this is uh, a picture of a view I believe that's right that's and, and, old and, <laughs> and and I guess I leave the question before we close out. I, I chose this picture to, to the end because it just looks like you're at home. You're very comfortable. You're just enjoying the house. Mm -hmm. And I guess my thought is, my question is, when you were initially living in the house, did you ever anticipate or did you ever think that in uh, you know, 60 years later that this house would become a Charlotte uh, landmark? that it would become uh, an icon, I would suppose, on mid-century modern architecture, and that it would be revered and, and studied. Uh, did, did, that ever, did that ever cross your mind living, when you were designing the house or building that, you know, what, what were you, did you ever think about that? No, and well, that, that never occurred to, to us. We thought 
uh, it's a place that we enjoyed very much and built by a, um, a good friend and, and a wonderful architect or designed by a good friend and wonderful architect. And um, um, what the only thing that um, is unfortunate uh, that I believe is we had added onto the house a studio building which no longer exists. We we didn't know you know until um, in recent years that it no longer existed. We didn't know why, but uh, um, someone said that the the neighbors who lived next to uh, to this property said that uh, something happened to the roof and it collapsed. I have no idea what it was, but that was an area that we used a great deal during the time we lived in the house. Um, and we produced a, a good deal of our art in, the, in that space. That is, it's, it's become, it's such a wonderful house and the history behind it is, uh, I think, again, fascinating. And Charlie, you, I just tip my hat to you for your restoration of the or rest, rehabilitation of this house, and and Herb to you and and uh, Jose and uh, to Murray Whiston for y'all's vision when you built this house. Um, it truly was out there, as you had said, and. And it continues to be, I think, out there because it is just such uh, um, a house that we can study and learn a lot from of what was going on in the, you know, in the mid-century. And with that, uh, I guess I will allow uh, if Charlie or Herb, if y'all have any comments you'd like to say or, and then we can open it up, I guess, Clarissa, for questions. Is that correct? But uh, we are just delighted as Preservation North Carolina to have been involved with this. Charlie, do you have anything you'd like to add uh, about your adventure in renovating this house? You think you'll take on another one? Happy to take on another one. I, I think, you know, if anything, I, I want to acknowledge Preservation North Carolina uh, for, you know, what you do and and how, you know, how, how you understand what the uh, preservation and restoration process is and uh, your adv advocacy for it. And, you know, I just, it, it's been a pleasure working with you all. So thank you. you say the same thing here. Herb, do you have anything you'd like to add before we answer any questions? No, it's just that uh, um, I'm honored to know that the house is, uh, contains our names on it of course it's such a beautiful space and and that it is being preserved well thank you all and, and clarissa i'll let you open it up for do we have any questions uh, from folks out there you all hear me yes okay good i had to do a check recently zoom doesn't like to get my first words out um so i i want to thank you all again all of ted Charlie and Herb, this was a really, really good um, session that we had. And we, I feel like we got some really unique insights into the history and kind of renovation of the house. So thank you all three of you all for a great presentation. We do have a few questions in the Q&A. I'm going to go ahead and go to those. And then if folks have questions, please um, just click that button and type them in and we'll um, get, them, get them asked. Um, so our first one is for... Herb, um, what did you love most about living in this house? I love the space, the openness about the house and the, the warmth uh, that the materials that it was built out of uh, gave to the, the whole atmosphere of the house, the, the, those Philippine mahogany ribbon striped panels uh, were especially uh, enjoyed not only by us but by other people and friends and um, 
like when you could move around in the house. It was it was uh, beautifully designed by by Murray Wisnant, and um, um, we loved the the openness of the outside and the ability to to feel like you could you know bring in the outside um, into the house. Um, we have a question from um, Betty Womack. Is the new front door the original, the color of the, is the new front door the color of the original color? I the, doubt it. <laughs> the original color of the, of the um, house was a pale, was a, a pale tan color, very pale tan color, um, almost uh, like a pale pine color. As a, and it had the, uh, the dark brown um, trimming around the uh, wood, uh, around the, the window areas and around the, the and the door areas. Um, we have a question from Cynthia Wilson, who wanted to know how many square feet is the house? The original house was 1,728 square feet. Exactly. <laughs> and the cost was 24,624. 24,600 and something dollars for the, the actual construction. Square <clears throat> footage has not changed, has it, Charlie? <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, the price has changed a little bit, not, not the square footage. Yeah. And, you know, I'll say something about, about paint color because I didn't know what the original color of the home was um, when you know when I had it painted, but uh, I went with kind of a, a lighter taupey gray color, and there weren't any restrictions for what color to paint the home. So you know, a lot of people I know had a lot of different opinions, but uh, when it was all said and done, we I thought it was important to really let the architecture of the house do the talking um, rather than going too bold with paint. So. That's what that's what we landed on. It works very well, though. It works really well. The paint, the color scheme that you have. Um, what other questions, Carissa? That um, one more question um, for Herb. Uh, what is your blowing um, blowing rock house like? And just thank you for being part of this wonderful presentation. It's a gift um, giving me joy. Um, so yeah, so they want to know about your blowing um, rock house. The Blowing Rock House was totally different than this one. It was a, it was a rectangular box, actually, two stories. Um, the each of us, Jose, had a studio on one side of the downstairs store. The the original the downstairs story. I had the other half for my studio, and we had three bedrooms and uh, two baths and a living dining room and kitchen upstairs and a deck and hallway and a uh, very simple construction. Um, another half bath downstairs. And then it had a, uh, a 20 by 40 building, half of which was a garage and um, the other half was my kill room. All right. Um, we have a question from uh, two questions or two people with the same question. Um, or if you're willing to share, Charlie, uh, a rough estimate of how much the restoration cost. Well, it 
cost more than I was uh, expecting from the get go, but that's uh, that's to be expected when you you know when you open up walls on a on a sixty year old home. I, I will say that you know I I spent money in places on this house that uh, I spent more money in places that I probably would do in a you know in my work with with when the goal is to to renovate and resell and, and make a margin. Um, it, it, uh, I originally budgeted a hundred thousand and I was probably, uh, closer to 130 all said and done, but you know, that's, that's because I decided to go bigger on, you know, certain aspects, tile selections and, and things like that. And, you know, trying to, trying to replicate, uh, something from, from the sixties is, is not easy and you know those materials are often more expensive than uh um than you would otherwise expect plus you know <clears throat> all the all the major systems of the home were were replaced uh electrical plumbing mechanical uh one of the largest expenses was was the flat roof which um we we took off um what my roofer estimated, or he didn't estimate, he weighted out at the dump at eight tons of old roofing material, including gravel, tar, uh, all that. Had to replace a third of the roof decking. And then we went back with a uh, commercial grade, you know, modern day product um, to, to keep the house protected. So that was one of the largest expenses right off the bat. It was not cheap to do. All right, well, thank you, Charlie. Um, we have a question from um, our PNC president, Mark Howard, um, he wanted to know what did the folks of Charlotte think about the house when it was built? Well, I'm, a lot of people enjoyed the house when it was built. Um, It was a little avant-garde, I guess, the house, the people. Was, there were very, very few um, modern structures, residences in, in Charlotte at the time. Um, um, people enjoyed our home and, and uh, had good times in it. And, and, and we never had any complaints or, or negative remarks from anyone about the, the structure. And um, so other than sending out a questionnaire to the rest of Charlotte, I, I can't say any more about that. I, I just know about the people, friends and relatives who um, came and, and uh, were in the house with us. Absolutely sounds like folks enjoy the house. Um, we have a question from um, Suzanne Botts and she wants to know, was it central, was there central air conditioning in the house? Yes. Wow. All electric home. Um, and was a, we used a, uh, had a heat pump. Nice. All right, well, I don't see any other questions here in the Q&A. There are lots of good comments um, here in the chat, um, praising you all's work. I love the kitchen and the bathroom, fantastic house, nice swan chair. Um, thank you for sharing a beautiful, sensitive renovation. Um, so people, people really love um, the house and what you've done with it, Charlie, and really appreciate the history. Um, of it. We had one comment. Um, the house is absolutely fabulous. Um, Mirror's house is right around the corner from mine and my kids grew up sledding down the big hill adjacent to a slide. I've been uh, by Ur Urban Charlie's on several occasions to watch the progress. Um, so with that, um, if there are no other comments, we'll go ahead and close out. Um, again, there is a link in your survey which will pop up as soon as we uh you leave the webinar you should get a survey that should pop up if you all will take a few minutes um to finish that 
And then you also, you should get a, a kind of a reminder about the survey um, tomorrow. And again, there's a link in there. If you're you know, appreciating the work that we're doing, the educational programs, we would certainly appreciate um, your support, um, financial support to keep on doing that. I want to thank um, again, Ted, Charlie and Herb for joining us um, this afternoon for our last uh, shelter series session. And um, you all please be on the lookout. We will be doing um, more shelter series in 2021. And yeah, we will make the, um, the recording of this, the video of this will be available um, on our website and our social media channels. Um, just as soon as I get it posted, which will which will be this week. So um, look out for that. All right. All right. Thank you all. And thank you, thank you Charlie. And I, I'll just add, I'm, I want to thank Mia Kenestrari, who's a volunteer with Preservation North Carolina, for helping me to put together my presentation. And we can't do our, what we do without our volunteers. They do a great job. But thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Herb. And thank you, Clarissa. Uh, this has been a great great presentation and I'm so happy that Preservation North Carolina was able to be involved in the preservation of such a fine house and a cool history. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you very much. It was fun. Thank you all. Happy holidays everyone. All right. Bye-bye.